Hello, my name is Steve North and my talk today is called Umamimi, The Wind of Heaven Blows Between the Gentle Flicks of My Robotic Horse Ears. So this is me. Uh, I'm primarily a computer science researcher with a, a long history of working in human computer interaction, that's HCI, with a specific focus on animal computer interaction, ACI. More recently, computational anthrozoology. I'm a qualified natural horsemanship instructor with animal behaviour, ethology and horse training experience. So what would be a good place to start? I considered starting this talk very conventionally, introducing my research, my research group, etc., and then moving on to the topic. But my work on Umamimi is all about staying in the moment and joining the herd. So I'm going to cut straight to the interesting bit and then I'll come back to some more of the academic stuff later. Here I am with two of my horse companions. This is Free on the left, who's an American quarter horse, and Duke on the right, who's a Dale's pony. In the photograph, I'm wearing the Umamimi robotic horses. In a minute, I'll show you a video of this device in action, but for now, an image will do. I've spent much of this summer in eared as in wearing my ears, my robotic ears, and mixing with my horses. I can't claim to have lived with them, but I joined the herd twice a day, and sometimes I wear umamimi, sometimes I don't. I'll come back to talking about autoethnography later, but it's sufficient to say that it offers a useful way of accounting for or describing the particular, the micro and the situated elements of our lives. This is why I gave this presentation the title that I did, The Wind of Heaven Blows Between the Gentle Flicks My Robotic Horse Is. I'm trying to reflect that my work on Umamimi has a strong emphasis on self-reflection and my own in the moment experiences of becoming a horse-human assemblage. This is an example from my fieldwork notes I've taken over this summer for Umamimi. I share space, spend undemanding time and practice deep hanging out. The wind blows over the long tall grass as I sit with the horse herd, living amongst them and yet separated by our morphology and divergent evolution. As subtle signals are exchanged through the smallest movement of their ears, I'm reminded how crucial these long, expressive ears really are to a horse. Two long signal flags clearly visible above their heads with the ability to move together or when orientated individually to signal divided attention or a newly identified audio event in the soundscape. So what are the origins of the name? Umamimi means horse ears or horse eared. And I've used this name to reflect the Japanese tradition called Kimomamimi, which means animal eared. This is found in both anime and manga. It describes characters that possess animal-like features. The characters will be predominantly human and any real animal characteristics are minimal. Generally, Kimomamimi characters have ears and a tail which are animal-like. Often this is just part of their attire and can easily be removed at will. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my previous work, my academic career. I'm getting slightly more formal now. Using quantitative ethology based approaches for the analysis of human animal interactions. That's been my main thing. One of my previous projects was Habit, the horse automated behavior identification project, where I researched horse human interaction and specifically automated behavior identification from video. I also worked on a project called Pirelli versus Isis which was evaluating less orthodox horse training programs against evidence-based good practice in equitation science. And this was using computer-based logging methods. The commonalities between these types of projects I've worked on before are video analysis, comp computer-based video analysis, and the use of ethograms. So more recently, my research interests have become slightly more esoteric. I've been looking at various themes, lenses, and methodologies. For example, uh, non-human animal somatechnics, which is, this is something that I proposed as a lens to view the intervolvement between non-humans and the technology-based interventions, systems, and artifacts that we expose them to. 
and the enhancements and modifications that we as human animals make to their bodies. Then there's also ethnography. I mentioned that earlier on, and it's something that I've applied to Umamimi. Using written self-reflection to explore personal experience and to connect this autobiographical story that you've created to wider cultural, political and social meanings and understandings. Another way to, to frame that is the use of personal experience to explore cultural practices. It's a good way of accounting for or describing the particular, the micro and the situated elements of our lives. Then there's ethnographic science fiction or design speculative fiction. Ethnographic science fiction can also be known as fantastic speculative or anticipatory ethnography. This is described by Anne Galloway, who's specialised in this area as, quote, a story that could have been discovered and told by an anthropologist, unquote. Ethnographic science fiction is closely related to design fiction, which describes a methodology for both one creating fictional worlds via design based practices and two exploring the social and cultural implications of design practice and technology. The speculative scenarios depicted in design fiction and ethnographic science fiction and the fictional worlds within which a story is recounted may be rendered more tangible by the detailed technological artifacts that inhabit them. Then there's imaginary studies. This is something that I've been working on more recently. This has allowed me to use my lived experience as a lens to consider how my non-human companions might respond and possibly more importantly, why I think they might respond in the manner that I'm suggesting. My intention in using imaginary studies is to tell the story of not only the building of the physical artifact, but also the process of designing a quantitative study the challenging part of this is to think through the study without actually doing it, at least not yet, and then to speculate about the results of that study. I see my framing of imaginary studies as similar to the thought experiments popular with philosophers and ethicists. I've actually been working on an imaginary study, which is a quantitative experiment, evaluating the Umamimi robotic horse ears, and by its imaginary nature, I'm able to rehearse and pick apart the elements of this study. After all, no one has actually expects a philosopher to go out and find and perform something that they've come up with in the thought experiment. Uh, but it is still their thought experiments are still design studies which have been rerun countless times by ethicists and philosophers. So um, my argument is, why can't we do that in other other domains? So here's a bit of an introductory video to Mimimi. Okay, so that was a short video just previewing Umamimi and showing you in a fun way some of the elements of it. 
So what's my inspiration for Umamimi? Here are some ear examples. For example, on the um, far left, we've got the cable controlled animatronic ears for the horse puppets in Michael Morpogo's War Horse, the stage show. Interestingly, not using a lot of animatronic electronics, it's, it's belt driven, connected to um, bicycle cables and, and uh, brake levers, which are operated by the puppeteer. Um, to the bottom, to next along on the pink background, we've got NeuroWare's Nekomimi, which is allegedly a brain controlled cat ears set. Nekomimi means cat ears in the same way that Umamimi means horse ears. So the, it, allegedly this had an EEG device built into it. So it wasn't about movement as Umamimi is, it was supposed to be responding to emotion. And these were quite popular devices, they sold quite a lot of them, but no one was actually sure whether they were really doing what they claimed to. So moving along, we've now got two other companion robots also with expressive ears showing how ears are considered to be an important part of even fairly basic robotic companions. The one with the blue ears is the Miro biomimetic robot. And the one to the right of that, the predominantly white with the red flashes on, on its belly, is the Nubber's Tag robot. So these are all things I looked at when I was thinking about Umimimi. Oh, I've, mi I've missed out the um, kitty animatronic ears at the top there, which were, I think, responsive to movement. Uh, I'm not sure whether they used an accelerometer, but they were a sim similar idea. So thinking a little more a bit more about how my work relates to human and other animal assemblages that's situations where non-humans and humans come together in some kind of unified form um, obviously this crosses over somewhat between kind of areas like cultural and literary studies and also into performance art so we've got here a couple of examples of performance artists there's uh, Marion Laval Jontet, who is left and far right. Uh, and the particular one on the far left is May the Horse Live in Me, which she apparently actually injected herself with horse blood and wore these horse hooves. And in the centre, we have Lisa Bufano, who made herself into an animal, but strangely was also an assemblage with furniture legs as well. Carrying on from that theme, we have Thomas Thwaites, also known as the Goat Man, who took a holiday from being human and using his prosthetics and, and robotic attachments, made himself to, into a goat and for a period of time lived on the hillside with, with a herd of goats and wrote a book about it, which you can see at the bottom there. So horses and their, their use in communication and why they're important to the horse. This is something if you're familiar with horses you'll understand but let's talk about it anyway. There's literature in the field of equitation science suggesting that horses follow the directional ear movements of other horses as attention cues and that they also respond to human gaze cues in the same manner. The equine ear is a complex anatomical component as a veterinary horse owner's textbook states quote each ear can be swiveled independently through 180 degrees or laid back shutting it off such mobility is achieved with 16 auricular muscles attached to the base of the pinna humans have only three such muscles all of which are vestigial Easily visible at the top of the head, a horse's ears are used to signal emotional state and intent in response to directional sounds. A horse will then flick an ear towards the source, or if the sound is coming from the front, pricks both ears forward. This is actually my one of my toy robotic horses, but I, I like the uh, exaggerated ear, so I quite often use it to, to demonstrate this about ear positions and how horses from different viewpoints still appear to have these two vaguely cylindrical parallel objects sticking out the top of their heads, however you view them. So making Umamimi, there are two pictures here. On the left is the interior uncovered version, and you can see it's all very kind of maker culture and um, it's not developed in a high tech lab. I've got some background in electronics and building and things, but this is more about building a prototype and getting it to work. On the right, you can see it's been covered here in black, black fake faux fur 
So the Umamimi hardware is built on the metal framework with the, as I said, with the faux fur covering. Uh, two micro server motors each move near independently in incremental steps to a maximum range of 180 degrees. At the heart of the device is an all-in-one electronics project board. This board is, pro is powered by a programmable processor. The software for Umamimi was developed using the Arduino programming language, which is a set of C and C++ functions for anyone who's interested in coding. Umamimi responds to detected changes in an accelerometer similar to the one in the smartphone you might well have in your pocket right now, when the user, the human user, moves their head. The default position for the Umamimi ears is neutral. Beyond this, in response to changes in the user's head orientation, Umamimi has four predefined movements. Fully forward, fully back, one ear turned left and one ear turned right. What happens when there's no input from the wearer? I hear you possibly asking. This might be considered the device's default behavior. When, when idling and awaiting instructions, configurable code profiles have been developed, allowing the device to perform random micro moves. These can be used to model the characteristics of different horses or horse emotional states. Um, describing this in any details a bit but beyond the scope of this presentation, but I, am, I have actually um, written a publication describing how this works. But in short, it means that I can actually observe a specific real horse and I can then, through uh, using a, an ethogram and a, a process of recording their ear movements and characteristics, I can feed that in as several parameters to Umamimi and its random movements, the ones that aren't controlled by the user, will start to mirror the laconic slow movement or the flicky fast constant movements or how much the ears are together, etc. So at the moment, I'm just running with an ear profile which when making random micro moves doesn't move that much. But I'm just going to show you how the user triggered moves work. So if I move, tip my head slightly to the right, the ear should track right and stay there until I bring my head back up again. So that's the accelerometer reading my head position. I have to, to some extent, get a feel for where the level position is. So that's the left position, should be. Then there's the more dramatic pull ears back, which is a bit like the kind of horse pinning, pinning in anger or fear. And then there's a slight forward tip of the head, which brings the ears forward into a kind of for the tension position. So I'll see you again, right ear, left ear, right ear, left ear. Ears back. Tension place. Okay. So, what further work is there to do on this? I've submitted a paper for publication which describes the technical aspects and the configurable profiles. That's the, the aspect that's about being able to um, model other live horses. That includes a workflow for observing the real horses and modeling their characteristics using the device. So this is all very quantitatively based, this aspect of it. This is all about ethology techniques, observation, um, perhaps using multiple observers, checking inter-rater and intra-rater reliability and it's all done properly in that kind of quantitative way so you can see how i'm crossing over quite a lot in my methodologies between quant qual and hybrid in between and descriptive as well i've also submitted a paper for publication which uses, uses auto ethnography and speculative fiction to tell the story of a, an imaginary study which is about quantitative research but it is is itself qualitative um, that's about evaluating how horses respond to seeing attentional cues from Umamimi. There is a lot of research already in existence in equitation science looking at how horses respond to images shown of other horses paying attention to a particular bucket of food or a particular item and whether they actually respond to the image as they would a real horse. And I'm proposing in this imaginary study that I would do the same thing but with a short video clip of Umamimi turning its ear to indicate interest in something. 
Then I'm also working on another autoethnography, which is of a, a summer lived Aeneid, which is much more like the kind of um, descriptive storytelling short excerpt that I read from my field notes. It's about my impressions and my self-reflection on trying to be part of the herd and using the robotic ears as a way to improve communication or to see if that's even possible. Obviously, this is a crude way to do it. No one is seriously suggesting that this is going to become an a interspecies communicator. But it's all about trying to understand what is important to horses, what form of communication. The ears are particularly important. And so I've focused my work for now on the ears and the technology involved in it. And I'm going to bring it to a close there. So uh, I'd like to thank you very much for listening to me. And I hope the rest of the conference goes really well. I'm sorry I can't be there to see it. It sounds like there's some fascinating topics. Thank you.